if you weren't here last week, please be sure to sign in. I know it feels old school Baptist, but it really actually, um, one, it is, we are old school Baptist, so there's good, <laughs> that's good too. Uh, and it, it helps our church know that there's an appetite for this kind of content, so it's actually really important for you to sign in so that we can just show that people want to talk and hear about these kinds of things. It also enters you into a drawing for, to win some of the books that we uh, are using as we're preparing all of these different lessons. So there's benefits there too. Um, another reminder, by the way, if you weren't here last week, my name is Kimberly Cook. I'm his wife and he's Travis. You all know him. <laughs> and we are just thrilled that you're here. Sorry, I didn't welcome. I need to welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. And for those of you that returned, that is really brave of you, and we are honored that you came back. Um, okay, so just a couple other housekeeping items before we dig into everything. Just a reminder that this, we're doing a four-week run of the Trinity. This is the second week, and then we have a four-week run of eschatology after that, and all of that flows into a connect group that actually has already existed and so if you are looking for a connect group, looking to talk more about these kinds of things, know that there is a long-term trajectory that you can join, or you can just be here for whatever you think is interesting for these next eight weeks or next six weeks. So uh, that reminder done, today's, uh, that's not important. And then um, just the outline for today is we're going to be talking about the second person of the Trinity, the Son. We're going to be talking about his deity, his humanity, his works, and his return. So that's kind of a little bit of a preview as to what we are going to try to talk about. And you ready? Are you ready to laugh? Each one of those things in five minutes. It's going to be ridiculous. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and pray, and we will get rolling. Did I miss any announcements before I do it? Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing all of us together in this place for this time. Thank you for the privilege that we have to um, talk about you, to learn about you, to hear from you. And thank you that you have condescended to reveal yourself to us and reveal these things through scripture, Lord. And we just ask that uh, the things that Travis and I say are true. We ask that they, everything that is said here results in worship and results in lives changed and doesn't just become head knowledge, Lord. And more than anything, in light of what we're talking about today, Lord, we just, we thank you for your son. We thank you um, just for the incredible gift that he is to us and for everything that he has done and will do. And we just offer up this time and ask that it would be honoring to you as we talk about you. In your name, amen. All right, so first we're going to talk about the deity of Christ. Um, <laughs> so one thing that's important to understand first, so we talk about the Trinity being three persons, one substance. So the three persons of the Trinity, one substance being God. So then when we get to Jesus, when we get to the second person of the Trinity, we have one person, two natures. So those are, those are very important historical Christian, like that's how we talk about the Trinity, that's how we talk about Jesus with regard to who they are, kind of what they, they he is. It's so hard. Trinity is so hard. Okay, um, so we're, today we're going to be talking about the two natures, so humanity and deity. Deity, why do we believe that Jesus is 100% God. So we're going to, um, the short answer is because that's what the Bible tells us. Uh, that's really, that's all, that's all we've really got to go on. That's one of the big jobs that the Bible has is to tell us uh, about Jesus, what he did, and how we can be saved and have eternal life with him and redemption and that whole story. So really, it's the Bible, but we're going to dig into what the Bible says. So the Bible, the first thing that the Bible tells, oh, the first way we know that he's 100% God is that, this is going to shock you, he is actually called God in the Bible. I know that that's 
just baffling. But uh, there's two specific words that are ascribed to Jesus that are very important and are how we know that he is God and are some of the strongest statements that there are. Uh, you'll see there uh, Colossians 1.19 and Colossians 2.9 on your hands out are there. And those very clearly state Jesus' divinity. But elsewhere in scripture, two, two different terms are used. There's God, which is theos in Greek. And then there's Lord, which is kurios. Did anybody tell me? Some of you nodded your head. Can anybody tell me the difference? Anybody brave? Okay. Well, the good thing is I know the difference. All right, so uh, God, theos, is more of the idea of a transcendent being who is in control of all of human affairs. So it's more of the term probably equivalent to God in, in English. So everything you think of when you hear the term God goes with theos. Kurios is actually a, a, is an interesting term, uh, and that is the Luke 2 11 and the next couple passages there. Kurios is, is a word that is used a lot in the New Testament um, and in the Greco-Roman culture, and it could be somebody like the Lord of a household. It could be a very general word, but there is also specific times in the New Testament that it is used in a way that means, um, that means Yahweh, basically. And the reason that it is used that way and how it came to be used that way is that there was a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. So does that, everybody tracking that? So there was a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures that the Hellenists, the Greek Jews, used. So when they were saying, and, and in that Greek translation, it's called the Septuagint, in the Septuagint, the word for Yahweh was kurios. So there are certain times in the New Testament when kurios is used, they're saying, oh, this is my Lord. This is Yahweh. So the passages you have there are just some of the examples of that. So sometimes when you see Lord in the New Testament, it doesn't always mean God, but sometimes there are very important ones where it is used that way. So we believe he's 100% God because the Bible tells us that he is in using two particular terms, especially. The second reason we see that is we see evidence of his attributes. Uh, so we're building a little bit on what we talked about last week for those of you who were here when, we talked about, when Travis talked about the attributes of God. So I'm not going to take a ton of time to unpack each one of them, but hopefully those of you who may be visiting this time will kind of pick up as, as we go along. So um, the first thing attribute we see uh, that is the attribute of God, and we see it also attributed to Jesus, is omnipotence. Can anybody, so that means all-powerful, can anybody tell me or think, like let's think out loud, where do we see omnipotence, Jesus demonstrating omnipotence? You, you also have the passages in front of you. The miracles, exactly. Yeah, the miracles are the big one. Um, especially you have in front of you the calming of the storm and water into wine. And you might, and, and there are some people who argue and say, well, that doesn't mean that Jesus is God. It just means maybe he's a real person who's empowered by the Holy Spirit. So the, re the reason calming of the storm and water into wine are important is because those accounts actually say, so after, after the, he calmed the storm, they said that they, the disciples marveled at him. It wasn't that they marveled at the Spirit. They didn't marvel at God. They, mar they marveled at Jesus because of the omnipotence that he displayed. Water into wine, it manifested Jesus' glory. That, it manifested his glory. That's what the, the text says. So we see his omnipotence there. The second attribute we see in the New Testament is eternity. Here, it's a little bit harder. <laughs> I'm not going to ask for examples here. But here we see in John 8, 58, he says, Before Abraham was, I am. And that's the big Moses, I am. Tell me your name, Lord, I am. That's that I am. So we see that Jesus is linking himself all the way back to that statement, at least, that was made to Moses. And then in Revelation 22:13, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. 
the beginning and the end. So we see his eternity there. Uh, the third attribute we see is his omnipresence. Okay, omnipresence means being present everywhere. Why would this be a difficult thing for us to talk about with regard to Jesus? Anybody? Precisely. <laughs> so Jesus, as 100, being 100% human, is physically located. So this is kind of squishy territory. Even the, the theologians I was reading were like, this one's difficult to talk about. Um, so just be aware if, you've, if you notice that you're in good company. There are a couple passages, though, specifically after he has resurrected that we see it seems like there's an element of omnipresence here. So uh, Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered. Matthew 28, I am with you always. If you think that those aren't the strongest, I would probably agree with you. But again, we're dealing, that's when we get into those two natures. We get into 100% God, 100% man. And at the end of the day, we are always going to have to punt to mystery eventually <laughs> because none of us are really sure exactly how that happens. Um, but we don't want to punt to mystery too early. So the... Sorry. There it is. Sorry. I was... My second part was there. And I was like, that's not what we're talking about. All right, the other another attribute we see is sovereignty. So that means really authority possessed by God. So where do we see Jesus establishing his authority? Can you guys think of any of the stories about Jesus from the Gospels? Where do we see him establishing his authority? What? In the temple? Oh, that's a good one. He redeems over demons. Yes, very good. Yes, demons is a very, I didn't have that on here, but that's a good one. Yeah. Um, Mark 2, it also has him forgiving sins. And that was a very, you know, if you remember that account, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders kind of double take when he says that, because that is something only God can do. And Matthew 5 is a, uh, <clears throat> is when he says, you know, you have heard this said, but I say to you. You have heard this said, but I say to you. Again, that kind of teaching is demonstrating a remarkable amount uh, and claiming a remarkable amount of authority because he's saying, here's what you learn from the prophets and, you know, Judaism and all of that, but I'm saying to you this now. So he's making a, a distinctive authoritative claim as he says that. The final attribute we see is that he is worshipped as God. So uh, the passages that you have show that he's honored by God the Father, shows that he's honored and worshipped by angels, and the final passage, he is honored and worshipped by everyone and everything, all creation. So that also shows us, like, no, it seems like there's, there's deity going on here. Do you want me to stop, or do you want me to talk about kenosis? Go for it. Okay. Um, so there's a big question with regard to Philippians 2 specifically about, about whether what it means when it says that Jesus emptied himself. So the term is kanao, means to empty. To, Philippians 2 7 says he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And the idea that, was put, that has been put forward by some theologians is the idea that Jesus voluntarily emptied himself of at least some or all of his divine attributes. So a little bit of a historical background as to where that idea, which you may have heard of, where that came from, it really came about in the 1800s when after the Enlightenment kind of swept through and the church was really and theologians were grappling with Enlightenment ideas and the suspicion about anything supernatural or divine that came out of the Enlightenment and an emphasis on rational thinking. So they were, there were some theologians who were uncomfortable <laughs> with the idea of divinity, and this seemed like a really good place where you could kind of get rid of some of that. 
and, and explain some of that away. And he's still a person, but, you know, he didn't actually, he, he actually gave it up. So it's not like there was anything divine really about the man Jesus because he gave it up. So that, that's the idea, the historical background behind it. You may have heard that idea. I, I hear this sometimes passed around in the church, but it's very important that we kind of put our heels in the sand or whatever <laughs> um, and not let that go because all of church history didn't seem to think that that was the case because nobody thought about that or read that in Philippians 2 before the 1800s, including people who were native Greek speakers who would have known and used the word kanao, and they didn't think that that's what Jesus like did. So that's really important. <laughs> uh, the second reason is that the text doesn't actually say that he emptied himself of power. It says that he emptied himself. So that's, that's an argument from silence, but it is important, especially when you take into account the context of Philippians 2, which is, seems to be talking about humility and giving up some sense of privilege and status instead of divine attributes. And the context even more is important when you think of the fact that Paul is actually encouraging the Philippians to be like Jesus, which makes a lot more sense with humility and giving up status and privilege than it does with emptying yourself of attributes. He, Paul's not encouraging the Philippians to empty themselves of personal attributes. That doesn't make any sense. It's probably talking about humility. So all church history, uh, the text doesn't actually teach that. And then finally, theologically, if we, were to, if we were to accept the idea that Jesus divested himself, that voluntarily emptied himself of his divine attributes, that denies the full deity of Christ, which we need, quote unquote, um, our understanding of salvation requires Jesus to be 100% man and 100% God so that he can be he can pay for our sins. He can be the mediator between us, as you um, have 1 Timothy 2, 5 there. And all of that is an understanding. It's an interpretation. So we as Christians can be open to different interpretations of our understanding of, the, you know, how the Bible theologically seems to be interpreted as believers. But one word in one verse is not a good enough reason for us to get rid of the divinity of Christ. So if you've ever heard that, if you ever hear somebody say, well, Jesus kind of gave up some of his divine attributes, you say, no, 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 he didn't, and we don't want to go there. So do you all promise to do that? It's very important. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, that's all for the deity of Christ. Did anybody have any questions? Yes. Yes. Omniscient, oh, there's a reason I didn't put omniscience on there because it was going to take too long to talk about. Um, that is debated. Don't give him a knuckle for that. Um, it's debated as to whether Jesus is omniscient. And here's where we get again into the uh, tension between 100% God and 100% man. Uh, it seems like there are passages that definitely discuss his, um, that, that seem to attribute omniscience to him. You know, um, at one point, one of the disciples says, well, you know all things, and you know all men and, in a different place, that, those kinds of things. So it seems like that. But Jesus himself says about the second return, he says, only the Father knows the Son of Man doesn't even know when you know, the end things will come. So that's why I didn't include it was because it was too complicated. Um, so it's, that's, that's the difficulty with some of these theological conversations is that there are, there are different passages that seem to say conflicting things. And so we have to kind of then be willing to say, well, we believe he's 100% God and 100% man, and we believe, and so in that way, yes, omniscience is there, but he tells us that at least something is limited. So we're not going to force our concept of omniscience onto Jesus. We will just say we don't fully understand, and we believe he's 100% God and 100% man. <laughs> so um, good question, not to, I teased you about it, but it's a good question. Thank you for bringing it up. Yes. Um, 
-hmm. He was, but he voluntarily submitted himself to that. And he at any point could have, but he, but it's not that he wasn't able that there's a, so if, if God is all powerful, he is able to do anything. It doesn't mean that he will do it. And so he was, he allowed himself to be killed because he was accomplishing his greater purpose because he was accomplishing his will. And, yeah, and he did not cease to exist. Correct. Uh, is the son the father and the father this? No, we want, we want to be very careful at, in Trinitarian language never to say that the son is the father. Well, mm. <laughs> so there's a, there's a very famous um, like picture symbol symbol of uh, of how to think about the Trinity, and so it, it's a triangle, um, and on the outside it says the Father is is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, or the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father, and then on the inside it also has connections <laughs> to each other and says the Son is the Father, the Father is what. No, it says the Father, because it's about the Trinity. So that's a complicated question is the answer. And, and yes, in that they are one substance, but no, in that they are three persons. And that's where you get into the distinctions. And, and when you're saying the Father is on the cross, that would be violating what Christians understand is happening with the persons of the Trinity. And if you have more questions about that, actually, I did a podcast called what happened to the Trinity on the cross? It's on um, dts.edu, their, their podcast. I have it on there, and we have professors, and we're talking about that very thing, because I, I appreciate that question, because I have the same one. All right, we need to go. <laughs> Travis, you do the humanity. All right, all right. Let's dive in here. Okay, um, so if somebody was, is, a human being, how would you know that? How would you know somebody's a human being? Like, how would you, how do we know, like, I'm a human and not a dog or, you know, angel or, I mean, I, what's that? Flesh. Yeah, I got, I got skin and bones. The senses. What do you mean, the senses, Tanner? Okay. You can see me. You can hear me. What's that? I can speak. Yep. I don't know. I've met some good boys that can speak too. Rough. What else? Rationality. Rationality, sure. How do you know I'm just not like an apparition standing here before you? What's that? Somebody say something. You can touch me, right? Yeah. You can smack me for being weird. Thank you, Tanner. He's a friend. All right, let's talk about the humanity of Christ. And this is really important because there's some people that have argued in history that Jesus actually wasn't human. He just looked human. It was really the, the son of God, but he, was, he, was, he wasn't really a physical human being. So let's talk about why uh, this is necessary. One, uh, scripture points to an actual physical human being. Genesis 3.17, right after the fall of man. Yes, Sarah, I'm going to Genesis. Right after the fall of man, God's laying down the curses, the consequences of what's happened, and he says, there's going to be enmity, there's going to be a, a, a strife between the offspring of the serpent, the offspring of Satan, and the offspring of the woman. And the offspring of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. He's going to undo the works of Satan. And so this is kind of seen as the first gospel preach, this promise that's come. So there's going to be a child of the woman, of a woman, who is going to overturn sin, death, and evil. Now, you might say to yourself, well, well, Travis, maybe that's just the way we read into it. We look back at it. No, no, no. Genesis 4.1, Eve has a son. His name's Cain. 
He doesn't finish all that well. But when he starts out, she names him Cain because she says, I have gotten a man or the man. This is the one. This is the guy who's going to overturn sin, death, and evil. Not so much because Cain kills his brother. But she's looking forward to that hope. Abraham. Abraham has a promise, a promise made to him. What's the promise? He's got a lot of promises. But what's one of the pro- name Name one of the promises. What's that? Offspring is greater in number than the stars, absolutely. Land, name, he's got all this stuff being promised to him, but in Galatians, in Galatians 3.16, Paul says, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring who is Christ. So this promise is understood to be made about Abraham's one individual seed, which is then extended to us through Christ. 2 Samuel 7, David is given a promise by God, and it says, God says to him, I'm going to build you a house. You want to build me a house for the temple. I'm going to actually build you a house, a spiritual house, a kingdom. And you're going to have a son, a descendant, and he's going to be on the throne forever. So David, for David to have a descendant, it's got to be a human being. It's got to be a person. There's going to be a human being to occupy the throne of David. Now this is typically, all this together are seen as the three offices of Christ. He's a prophet, he's a priest, and he's a king. And these are all human roles that a human being has to fill. And we'll talk about how that works later. But first, I want us to talk about how we know that Jesus, this person, the one we meet in the New Testament, how do we know he is a human being? Well, one scripture says that he's human. The word became flesh, John 1, 14. The son, if the son is not in the flesh, then you're a heretic, 1 John 4, 2. John is telling us, and scripture is telling us, hey, look, Jesus is a human being, the son of God put on flesh and dwelt among us. Scripture also shows that he's a human being. So there's physical, physiological evidence that Jesus is human, right? He was born. We know he was born. We just celebrated Christmas, right? A little town of Bethlehem, Jesus is born. We know he grew up, Luke 2.40. He gets older. Gods don't grow. I guess God does grow. It's 100% God, 100% man, right? Language is important. But if he was just a deity appearing to be human, he wouldn't have to grow. So he grows. He ate food. Luke 4, 2, it says he was hungry. Man, I'm hungry, right? Some of you are looking at the clock. You're like, this is my normal lunch hour. He's hungry. He drank something. John 4, he talks to the Samaritan woman. He says, give me something to drink, which implies that he drinks things. We know that he drinks later on. He slept. He slept in the back of the boat. Storm raging all around him. And he's going to sleep. We know he breathed. Mark 15, he breathed his last. Now that might be a metaphor, sure, but I don't think so. I think you can hear, if you've you've been around somebody when they pass away, you can hear the breath go out of them, right? So we know he shows himself physical attributes, but he also has emotional, spiritual, psychological evidence as well. He's an emotional being. Jesus got mad numerous times. He gets angry. He turns over a table at one point. It's pretty awesome. At one point, he gets mad, goes and makes a whip, and then, like, comes back. Imagine that scene. Like, hey, Jesus, what you doing? Making a whip. Why? I'm going to go chase some people out of the temple. Okay. So, like, premeditated anger. Like, imagine. That's pretty awesome. He was tempted. He didn't sin, but he was tempted. That's a very human thing to have happen to you. uh, Luke 4. He's taken into the wilderness to be tempted. Hebrews explains the temptation a little bit better there, that Hebrews passage I have. He had compassion. He sees the crowd. He's like, oh, they're hungry. They need something. He loved. John eleven five. 5, it says he loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He loved people. He was an emotionally pained individual. Luke uh, 22:44. there. I have it here. There it is. 
In agony, he prays more earnestly. He goes through agony. It's pretty amazing. That's a very human thing to do. He got irritated. That always makes me feel better. It says he was indignant. But he says, let the children come to me. Usually I get indignant, and I'm like, take these children away from me, please. (laughs) He was grieved. He wept. It's amazing that the shortest verse in all of Scripture communicates so much about who Jesus is. Jesus wept. He has a soul, 1227. He says, now is my soul troubled. He learned, Luke 252, says he grows in wisdom and stature in favor of God and man. And Luke 22, 52, that should be 52. Uh, he uh, says, if you are, no, that's right, 42, my bad, my bad. God, it's all over the place. If you're willing, remove this cup from me. But then he says, not my will, but your will, which means he has a human will. So again, imagine 100% God, 100% man, there's the divine will, but there's also his human will. He has human desires, human dreams for his life. He even says in John 5.30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Again, he says very clearly he has his own will. All right, let's see here. My notes are all confused. I'm going to use your notes. They're right there for me. No, they're not. It's the next one. Ah, I see it. Thank you. I'm always putting things together for him. Ouch. I love you. That was supposed to be a joke to give you time to look at your notes. All right. Um, Not a shot. (laughs) Let's talk about um, why is this important? Like, why is it important that Jesus is a human being? It's because of those three roles, prophet, priest, king. He's got to fill those roles. So you see there, Acts 3.22. What does a prophet do? What's a prophet's job? Tell us what's going to happen. That's part of it, sure. What else? What's that? Communicate with God, God? yeah. Speak Speak the truth. Prophet typically represents God to the people. Prophet comes in and says, hey, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. This is not going right, or this is what you need to do, or this is what God says, right? That's what a prophet does. A prophet fills that role. God promised to raise up a prophet from among his people, from, from Israel, to speak and to lead and to represent God to the people, a perfect prophet, one like Moses, but better. That's what Acts 3.22 talks about, right? A human has to fill that role human being representing who God is. Now, Hebrews 9, 24 to 28 talks about a priest. Why is a priest important? What's a priest's job? What does a priest do? Correct. He's the reversal of that. A priest represents the people to God. The the priest goes and offers sacrifices. The priest prays on behalf of the people. The priest stands in the gap for the people and says, no, Lord, Don't pour out your wrath on them. Here's a sacrifice instead. And this is what Jesus does. Jesus is a priest not only because he stands and intercedes for us. Jesus is also a priest because he offers the sacrifice, which is himself. He's the unblemished lamb. He stands in our place. The reason why we don't have to keep offering sacrifices after sacrifices after sacrifices is because Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, the complete sacrifice. He does not continually offer himself. His sacrifice is once for all, and then he sits down at the right hand of the Father, but he's representing us. He's praying our behalf. He's saying, no, 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 no. Travis, Travis is with me. Tim is with me. Tanner's with me. The priest represents. Priests often had to offer sacrifices not only for for their people, but for themselves as well, right? Jesus does not offer a sacrifice for himself. That's why he can be the sacrifice. Then lastly, what does a king do? It's a little bit of a curveball. You're not going to find a... What does a king do? What's a king's job? To rule. Yeah, what is a a good king? Isn't just ruling, though, in like a totalitarian sense. What's a good king going to do? What's that? Take Take care of his people. Be a shepherd, right? 
guide the people, care for the people. And you've probably heard this analogy before, but, but imagine a shepherd that completely understands, sympathizes, grasps exactly what the sheep are going through. Like imagine if you were like, you know the, you know the TV show that was it's old, but the dog whisperer. Like, he couldn't really talk to dogs. I don't know. I never saw it. Could he talk to dogs? Could he? I saw some, saw some people nodding their head. I'm like, That's, that needs to be a much more important show than it was if he could talk to dogs. Fair enough. There was limited understanding. Okay, good stuff. You always hold me in check. I love it. Good stuff. No, he could interact with dogs. There could be some understanding, but... What was amazing about him, I assume, was that like, he seemed to have an intuition with the dogs, right? Jesus Christ, because he is human, and it's important we say that, he is human. He's not was human. Jesus did not abandon his humanity after he was crucified, buried, and resurrected. The Son of God is eternally a human being. That is so important. Jesus did, wasn't a human being for 33 years and was like, I'm out. Going back to being non-corporeal spirit Jesus or spirit son of God. No, 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 no. He is still in the flesh and will be forever. He understands what we go through. He sympathizes with everything we go through because he is human. But at the same time, he's divine. He's king. He can rule. He can reign. He does what's right for us and what's right for you and me and for the kingdom and for the world because he's divine. So it's important that he's human so that he can lead us and guide us and shepherd us and care for us in the right ways. And now let's talk about what he does. Let's talk about the works. Yes. So yes. Oh, sorry. Questions. questions yeah. yeah. How could you have questions about that? I, I wouldn't say so. No, I don't think, I don't think scripture Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the, the question is, is Jesus the only, only person of the Trinity that we'll see? I, 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 I don't think so, because even, even in the Old Testament, you have uh, theophanies. You have, you have the appearance of God. Isaiah 6 is a good one, where it's very clearly the glory of God. They're beholding God. Now, now I, I don't know what it means to see. Like, like, again, God is spirit, so what does it mean to behold that? We will behold the glory of God. I don't know what that looks like, whereas beholding Jesus will definitely be different because he's in the flesh. So it'll be like sitting here looking at you and me in some regards. Sometimes, I think so, yeah, absolutely. I think there's evidence like the angel of the Lord uh, that appears. Uh, in like Joshua and Joshua like bends down and actually worships him and the angel of the Lord doesn't correct him. A lot of people think that's the, that's a pre-incarnate son of God appearing. You also have the, the three uh, people that visit uh, Abraham uh, before Sodom and Gomorrah and they're very clearly, it's very clearly God. Um, and so I think that's another instance. But remember, Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. And so there's very much a, a very present interaction uh, with the Godhead in the Garden of Eden. So when you think about what, the, what eternity looks like, go back to Eden, upgrade at a level, and, and that's, that's kind of how I get my understanding of what eternity with the Lord would, would be like. Any other questions? Yes. I almost thought about leaving that out because I don't want to answer that question. This group, man, this group. Tough yeah, tough questions over here. Uh, so one, um, what I would say is when he commits iniquity, he would discipline him with the rod of his mouth. Sure, that, that doesn't have to be untrue of Christ. It doesn't say he will commit iniquity. Uh, it, it, it doesn't, it assumes that he could, couldn't, whatever. Um, but it doesn't say that he will. The other side of it is um, between 
So there's, all, there's an already and a not, or there's a near fulfillment and a distant fulfillment. Solomon would be the near fulfillment as well. Like, like to get to Jesus, there will be other descendants. And so it's not just, just the Lord. Yeah, so that just, that's just how Old Testament prophecy typically works, is that it's, it's referring to something that will happen in the, from their perspective, their, the, near, the near historical future. And then typically it's also, there's, there's a larger one when you're talking about a messianic prophecy. So it, the, the, an, as another example would be that the virgin will give birth. Most interpreters think that there was actually a young girl, it doesn't mean that it was a virgin birth necessarily. <laughs> We've had this conversation but, <laughs> recently. It doesn't, um, that, that gave birth and it was relevant to that prophecy, but it was also later about Mary, pointing to Mary. So that's just how prophecy, Old Testament messianic prophecy works. Cool. I think it's a good segue for you. Yep. All right. So we talked about all of the ways that Jesus is distinct as God, 100% God, and we've talked about all of the ways he's very imminent and here with us, consubstantial, actually of the same substance as us, 100% man, um, human, I guess, if we're going to be modern. Uh, so we're at, next, we're at, finally, actually, if, if we have time for <laughs> they're talking about the return of Christ, um, we're going to talk about the works of Christ. And this specifically, Jesus did lots of things. He was 100% man. Um, he, lived a, he lived a life. So he did lots of things. What we're specifically talking about when we're talking about the works of Christ is the things that Jesus distinctly did that that either is something he can only do, only he could do, or that was kind of like for resurrection was the first one to do and then the rest of us might join him. So that's where eschatology will come in and hopefully we'll have a few minutes left for Travis to talk about that. Uh, so the works of Christ, I'm going to, can anybody... <clears throat> So within that description, that the things that Jesus distinctively did, what comes to mind? Something Jesus did that was distinctive, of, that would only really be possible for 100% God, 100% man. Sight to the blind. Okay, so the miracles. But the apostles, the disciples did miracles too. When he sent them out, they did miracles too. And, and Peter walked on water. I'm sorry, what was the, the cross? Yes, yes. So uh, I'm going to, I'll go, um, I'll raise you one, <laughs> even on the thief of the cross. And the atonement, no. It's a Baptist church. You're not allowed to raise or make I know. I, you language. know what's funny is I actually hesitated. I thought, Good oh, call. maybe I shouldn't have said that. Yeah. So I don't play poker. I don't even know how to, like, how to, I don't know what that even means. <laughs> so you just folded, is what you're saying. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Sherry, to, to your uh, suggestion, the atonement, the, what he accomplished on the cross is, one, is a distinctive thing that he did. That's probably the one we most are, you know, able to point at. So the atonement, it, he, the... A very easy verse to keep in mind with the atonement is by his wounds you are healed. So he died an innocent death to take the punishment that we didn't deserve. And so that was something only he could do to accomplish what only he could accomplish. So that was one of his works. Another one of his works, and I'll kind of jump back in time a little bit chronologically, he was incarnated. We just talked about that, but that's something that he did um, it wasn't just something that happened to him. The second person of the Trinity condescended to be made of the same stuff as us. And um, I heard this illustration one time, and it's just really effective. That is like, an, that is like you see that there is an issue in this ant colony. And you decide that you will become an ant to go help those ants. And you will now be an ant forever for the sake of those ants. Only like it's less. 
because we're less than that <laughs> in comparison to God. But like, think about that. He condescended to do that forever, like what Travis was talking about. Uh, the second thing he accomplished is in his life, and in his, um, as he really began his ministry, he established the, his kingdom. He, um, I, on here I put, he took the beach. So the idea is that he um, set up a beachhead. So if you think of like an invading army or an invading king or a king coming to claim territory, he, he took the first, you know, and, and established the beachhead. I don't really know how else to say it. <laughs> um, from which his kingdom would begin and would spread. And so uh, when we talk about the kingdom, we're talking about God's reign with the order and the justice that manifest his, manifest his presence and his purpose for creation. And it really is just setting everything right. And that's where we get the miracles that we've talked about. We, uh, that those were signs of the kingdom and that things were being set right and that God's presence and justice and compassion were were on the earth in a way that it never had been before. So the kingdom with Jesus coming um, was already, you know, we talk about the kingdom being already, not yet. So that's the already that we talk about. Jesus established his kingdom and he took the beach, essentially. Now, we also believe that the kingdom is not yet because he will return. The Bible tells us he will return um, and after the final judgment, the kingdom will fully be established. So he became one of us. He took the beach in that he established his kingdom. He paid uh, the atonement. We talked about that. And this is the other big one with Jesus. What's like, what's the really big thing? Come on, the really big thing, after, right after the cross. He didn't stay down. He <laughs> resurrected from the dead. He conquered death and rose from the grave. And this was something no one was really expecting him to do. Again, because the kingdom, uh, the Jews thought that the kingdom was going to be a political kingdom. And they thought everything would be set right within the normal unfolding of society, essentially, with the coming of with a, a Messiah. So then when that didn't happen and Jesus died... You can appreciate them all kind of being baffled. And then he came back to life. And goodness knows that showed something that they never would have seen coming. Except he gave them warnings about it, like in John 2, 19. But they didn't understand what he was saying. And I don't think I would have either. If he had said that, I wouldn't have expected, oh, that means you're going to come back to life. Um, this re the resurrection is the core of our faith. If 1 Corinthians 15, 14, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Uh, the resurrection is what our, yeah, what our belief comes down to. For scholarship in my world, uh, it is one of, if not the key dividing line between more conservative and more uh, liberal scholars as they're approaching, as they're approaching the Bible, it really comes down to okay, but do you actually think that this happened? Because if you actually think that this happened, then there is this story, and story meaning like account, this witness that the disciples have from the point that they saw him and they start spreading what they saw in their account. Or if it didn't actually happen, then Jesus died the disciples all got together and said, we're going to look like fools or we're going to get killed. And so we're going to come up with a story to help ourselves out of this situation. So those are, that's kind of where it divides it for, for everybody, but for scholarship specifically. And just a quick note on this with apologetics. This is, this is where, um, this is a dividing line for apologetics too. Don't let yourself get sucked. When you're talking to unbelievers or even other believers, don't let yourself get sucked into arguments about um, the credibility of the Bible or the existence of God or anything like that. I mean, they're, they're helpful. They're helpful conversations. Christians have good thoughts towards them. But when it really comes down to it, it comes down to, okay, you know, fine, we, I can talk to you about the Bible. But really the question is, like, the core of my faith is whether Jesus came to life. And the, we, his, history can prove that Jesus was a historical person. 
The question is, and, and that he was killed. Everybody pretty much accepts that. The question is, what happened after that? And that's what I'm asking you to consider. Or when you're considering the Christian faith, that's what you need to ask yourself. Don't ask yourself if it's the Bible is a credible witness. And I mean, there are, there are answers on both sides. It comes down to whether you actually believe this happened. So resurrection is one of his key works. And then the, the last two works I have are that he went up, <laughs> his ascension, which uh, we talk, Travis already referenced a little bit, and the key there is that he was 100% man and, then, um, and, and remains 100% man. He is standing by the, at the right hand of the Father, at, and this is his final work. He uh, stands up for us. He intercedes for us. Like, do you, like Jesus, <laughs> I love you, but no. no. Um, <laughs> like Travis was saying, he stands there and doesn't allow accusations to be um, thrown against us because he says, no, I paid for it. That's not, you can't, you can't accuse them because I'm here. Um, not to be confused with the interceding that the Holy Spirit does on behalf of us through prayer, just for the record, because that tripped me up for a little while this week. Which is next week. Yes, which is next week. We'll be talking about the Holy Spirit. All right. We made it to the return of Christ, hopefully, all of us. Oh, sorry, questions. Yes. Yes, so in that, yes, she's saying, what about overcoming evil as one of the works that, that Jesus distinctively did? And, and she's giving the, uh, the situation where there was a demon that could only be cast out in a certain way, and the disciples were unable, and he was able. Uh, I'll push back a little bit on that specific um, example, because he said this one can actually only be cast out by prayer. <laughs> so if they, perhaps if they had done that, they could have, but they weren't, you know, so... Again, that's like theological gymnastics. Um, but to your point, <laughs> yes, I think you're completely right that overcoming evil is a work of Jesus. I didn't have it here because I actually think that's a part of his second return. I would say at this point, he has not fully overcome evil. He has, he has defeated death. And again, he has established his beachhead of the kingdom, and he is more than powerful enough to do it. He just, that work isn't complete yet, so that's why it wouldn't be on there. But yes, I love that, because I really don't like sin, death, and evil, and I am all about it being overcome. Oh, TJ. That's a good thought, TJ. Um, yes. Uh, what? Okay, sorry. He was saying, thank you. Uh, he was saying perhaps his sermons could also be a work, a, a distinctive work, because he was re, he was basically reinterpreting everything that, that the Jews had thought was going to be the case. And so that would be a distinctive work. In that way, I, I can see that. Yes, I would probably say that... Um, I would hesitate to say that just because, like, all of his disciples and, and all of us can preach, um, like, I have that ability to preach the kingdom, and, and I would actually roll it into the kingdom. So his, his establishment of the kingdom was saying, no, this is actually what it has meant all along. Okay, one more question, and then we want to talk about the return. Ooh, that's a good one. Hmm. I might be wrong. What do you think? I would say Elijah and Enoch did not ascend of their own volition or will and power. They were ascended, they were brought to heaven by the Father, where, or by the Godhead, whereas Jesus, you know. Returned. Returned. Like, he there's a difference between taking a plane ride and flying the plane. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> That's what I would say. Get that. He's really good on his feet. That's why I was like, honey, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Return. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. So let's talk about eschatology. 
um, in three weeks. We'll see you in three weeks, because that's <laughs> when we're actually going to start talking about eschatology. No. Um, the only thing I would say about it, if I get to my page, is talk about the return of Christ. And um, there's a lot of stuff we don't know about the return of Christ. There it is. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of things like, you know, people are like, oh, are you going to get into like millenniums and raptures in four minutes? No, I am not. I am not crazy. Um, Tim LaHaye, all that stuff, we're not going to get into Left Behind. Uh, not today. But the Nicene Creed, which is what we've based our teaching off of today, we've kind of looked at the Nicene Creed um, and, and, and used that as a guideline. Um, it gives us everything we need to know about falling within the lines of orthodoxy for the return of Christ. And that's what's important. You can hold to a pre-trib, pre-millennial rapture. You can hold to amillennialism. You can be a preterist. And if you don't know what those things are, you need to come back in three weeks. Commercial. That's right. Um, brought to you in part by eschatology. Um, what you need to hold to is one, he will come again with glory. So the beachhead, as Kim said, was established at the incarnation, at the birth of Christ. But there's not going to be a beachhead when Christ returns. Full-on invasion. King is returned. Simba coming back from the wastelands with Timon and Pumbaa. It's going to be awesome. And, and it's not going to be a big secret. You're, you're not going to miss it, okay? Jesus talks about this. He's like, don't, don't, don't think like, so the, the Messiah is over here. The king is returned. No, 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 no. It's going to be unmistakable. He will come again with glory. Second, to judge the living and the dead is what the Nicene Creed says. Justice will be a part of God's eternal reign. So to Kim's answer about sin, death, and evil, justice, righting wrongs, that's going to be, the, the, the king doesn't have a rule if his laws and his ways are not enforced. And the king will be enforcing his rule and reign on the world. And then lastly, his kingdom is eternal. It will never end. There's not going to be a revolution. There's not going to be something that happens after that as far as like a change in government. Uh, the eternal kingdom is a monarchy uh, with a, 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 a sole sovereign, okay? So we will not be voting in the eternal kingdom. Uh, there will not be elections in the eternal kingdom. Praise God, there will not be elections. So you can retire your, so make, you, make sure you vote because this life is the only life you have to vote. Any questions on, on that? No, 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 sorry, the reason why I, I, I don't want to like bash democracy, I'm not. Whenever there is change in power, whenever power changes hands, there's turmoil. Look through the history, not just of our country, but look through history. Whenever a, a, a king would die, the king is dead, long live the king. When the new king would come up, is his son or daughter capable of reigning and ruling? There's all this turmoil that comes. What kind of a king do we have? Because the king is eternal, there is no turmoil. Everything is stable. That's why an eternal kingdom is beautiful, because there's stability, there's security with this benevolent king who has our best interests and the best interests of the kingdom in mind. So that's why it's important. Any questions? Yes, sir. Hmm, that's a good question. I have always taken it to read the to mean the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Uh, that is how I have read it. Um, that doesn't mean that that is necessarily the full exhaustive way to read it. I would say, if I were to answer it in a more fully, in a more full sense, that the, the life and works of Christ are the crushing of the serpent's head. So not necessarily a singular event, but who and what Jesus is is the crushing, if that makes sense. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. Yes, we're waiting on the, on the snake to die. I hate snakes, and I feel like it's biblical. I was about to say, we're all waiting on all of yes. the snakes to die. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions about anything? Eschatology, which means the study of last time, last things. All right, so we're, yes, sir.
<laughs> I think, again, I would point to the Garden of Eden and say whatever Eden was or was supposed to be, I think is a good understanding of what eternity is supposed to be, granted with clothing that says clothed with righteousness. Um, I think it's going to be an upgrade. It's like a 2.0. It's going to be a better sense of that. I don't know, um, you know, will you be able to go and visit, like, like, will I get to go take a trip to Boston in the eternal kingdom? Like, that kind of thing. I don't, I don't know those details. But I think a new heaven and a new earth will have work. It'll be good, fulfilling work. It won't be toil. You won't get up in the morning and be like, oh, my gosh, I've got to, there's no, there's no Mondays in the eternal kingdom, right? There's only ever Friday. Um, <laughs> it's good work. It's fulfilling. You will, you'll be occupied. I don't think that the eternal kingdom will be us just in an eternal worship service. Uh, I, I just don't think that's, that's how, I don't think that's what we were created for because that's not what Adam and Eve do and they're sinless. God has angels that I just don't think scripture backs up this idea of, of a big long eternal church service because frankly, like, it doesn't sound like heaven. And I like church, it just doesn't sound like heaven. So that's, that's my my two cents. There's lots of books. I would recommend uh, Surprised by Hope by N.T. Wright. It's a great book to read as far as, uh, Randy Alcorn, I think, also has a book called Heaven, which is a little bit, bit of an easier read. Uh, both of those are good works on what eternity looks like. So the last thing we wanted to talk about is how does this affect your life? And we're, we're going to do this quickly. Um, okay, so God came to earth, put on flesh, and died for you. I don't know how that doesn't affect your life. That changes everything about you. That changes, if you believe that, that should be, if that's true, let's just say if it's true, regardless of whether or not you believe it, if it's true, that reorients everything about ourselves, about the world, about what to expect, about what to desire out of life. That totally changes everything. If Jesus is the son of God, and if he was crucified, buried, and resurrected, and is coming again, then that should be the single thing, the single matrix through which you make every single decision in your life. It's not what's most profitable. It's not what's most safe. It's not what's most healthy even, although I think Jesus cares about your health. It is what is most glorifying to God. What is going to draw me closer to this wonderful creator who loved me so much that he became a human being, likened me to becoming an ant. It's a great analogy. So one of the things I would say is where do you need to incarnate? And what I mean by that is where do you need to be physically? We're not omni omnipresent. We're not able to be everywhere at once. But what area of your life needs you to be physically present? Is it your friends? Is it your job? Are you a little checked out at work right now? Is it your kids? Maybe your kids need you there right now. You need a little more time and attention. I'm taking a class right now. I'm playing with kids. Um, and it's like play therapy. And so um, it talks about nose and toes. Your kids need your nose and your toes. Wherever they are, they need you looking at them off your phone. Our phones are like the most unincarnate way ever to live. Uh, and I'm just as guilty as everybody else is. That's, that's kind of the way that I would say you would apply this. Baby, do you have any other? I think that was great. Cool. All right, the next week is the Spirit of God, and next week I am going to be preaching, so I won't be here, uh, but uh, you are in capable hands. My wife is still here, uh, so you're in more than capable hands. Again, 90, we're at 90% strength next week um, <laughs> if Kim's here by herself. Ouch. <laughs> Tanner said 95. Fair enough. Um, but uh, I don't know if you've met Daniel uh, Olander before. Daniel and his wife, Casey. Uh, Daniel is, uh, used to be an intern here, he worked with me, and um, was a blessed time. He now works uh, full-time uh, at the Village Church, and he is taking a class on Trinitarianism, and one of the requirements of the course is that he teach uh, a people about the Trinity. So he's going to step in uh, admirably for me next week. He's taught before, he's, he's spoken in the sanctuary uh, uh, services before. He will do great. You're in very capable hands. We're teaching together. And yeah. they, uh, Daniel and Kim will be teaching together. So it'll be just like me uh, here. Uh, no big deal. So let me pray and then y'all go and uh, do that thing that Jesus did, which was eat. Uh, let's pray. Father God, uh, thank you so much for sending your son. Thank you that we got to spend the last hour and change talking about 
your son who loves us and died for us and showed your love for us, Father. It's almost overwhelming. It is overwhelming to be loved so well and to be loved so much. I pray uh, that each person in this room this week, at some point, some moment unexpected, just like your son was at just the right time, Christ died for us. I pray that at just the right time this week, each person in this room would feel the overwhelming love of their Savior. And it would humble them and it would encourage them and comfort them at just the right time. We love you, Father. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thanks, y'all. Have a great week.